who is Larry Ray? Nobody really knows. He's a master manipulator, a master con man. He manipulated them into making their worlds smaller and smaller until they were totally dependent upon him. We're dealing with brain control, mind control. We're looking at a con artist on steroids. Lawrence Larry Ray was born Lawrence Greco in 1959 in the Bay Ridge neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York. Ray had a difficult childhood marked by mistreatment and instability. His parents divorced when he was young, and his mother later remarried a man named Gordon Ray, whose last name he eventually took. In 1981, Ray joined the Air Force but was discharged after just 19 days for unknown reasons. Shortly after, he managed to land a job on Wall Street as a stock trader despite lacking a college degree. He also dabbled in various industries, including insurance, gambling, and construction, and even operated a nightclub in New Jersey. Ray's chameleon-like ability to reinvent himself and weave intricate tales became a hallmark of his character. He claimed to have worked as a clandestine agent overseas, recovering Stinger missiles for the government and operating for the CIA in Russia. While many of these stories were later revealed to be fabricated, his ability to convince others was remarkable. In 1988, Ray married his high school sweetheart, Teresa. They would eventually have two daughters, Talia and Ava. Throughout the late 1980s and 1990s, Ray cunningly forged connections with numerous high-profile figures, including former Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. His network extended to then New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani, and he even facilitated a meeting between Giuliani and Gorbachev. Ray also befriended then NYPD Commissioner Bernie Carrick, even serving as the best man at Carrick's wedding in 1998. However, their relationship soured when Ray was indicted in 2000 as a co-conspirator in a mafia-related pump-and-dump scheme. Carrick was the police commissioner by then and refused to help Ray fight the charges. This led to a bitter falling out between the two men. Ray eventually pleaded guilty to securities fraud in 2003 and was sentenced to five years probation. During this time, he became obsessed with exacting revenge on Carrick, who he believed had betrayed him. He embarked on a relentless campaign to destroy the NYPD commissioner's reputation, even becoming a cooperating witness in an investigation that ultimately led to Carrick's imprisonment. In 2004, as Ray dealt with his legal troubles, his wife filed for divorce accusing him of physical violence against her. While the separation was granted, Ray managed to convince their children that it was their mother's fault. He brainwashed them into believing that her accusations were nothing more than fabrications. A year later, as part of the custody proceedings, Ray underwent a psychological evaluation, and the results were quite disturbing. The evaluator found it literally impossible to assess Ray in the usual clinical manner because of his ability to manipulate and control almost any situation, including a psychological interview with an experienced examiner. The evaluator described Ray as calculating, manipulative, and hostile beneath a charming exterior. He was eventually diagnosed with personality disorders, including narcissistic and histrionic traits. The report noted he exhibited signs of Pseudologia Fantastica, or Munchausen's disorder, characterized by habitual lying. Remarkably, despite the alarming evaluation, Ray continued to share custody of their children. In 2007, he was incarcerated for violating his probation related to securities fraud. Despite this, his daughter, Talia, remained convinced by her father's lies, so she refused to live with her mother and chose to stay at a youth center instead. In 2009, Talia entered Sarah Lawrence College, a private liberal arts college in Bronxville, New York. She moved into Slonim Woods 9, dormitory known for its communal living spaces and vibrant, close-knit atmosphere. Immersing herself in the college experience, Talia quickly formed close friendships with her dorm mates. While they enjoyed her company, they couldn't help noticing her deep obsession with her father. Talia is obsessed with Larry. He is the perfect dad ever, and he's been wrongfully convicted. She often recounted how her father served in the government, bravely taking down corrupt officials. According to Talia, Ray was in prison due to trumped-up charges orchestrated by the powerful enemies he made. Talia also mentioned that her father was about to be released from jail and needed a place to stay. She asked her dorm mates if he could temporarily live with them. Though they found the request unusual, they agreed. 
thinking it would be a short-term arrangement. At the start of Talia's sophomore year in September 2010, her father moved into her dorm room. By this time, the other occupants included Santos Rosario, Talia's former boyfriend whose family ran a small travel agency in the Bronx. Another roommate, Daniel Levin, was an introverted individual from New Jersey who aspired to become a writer. Then there was Claudia Drury. Originally from Los Angeles, she was known for her creativity and storytelling abilities. Though raised in a sheltered environment, her friends considered her friendly and outgoing. Finally, there was Isabella Pollock, who, like Claudia, came from a sheltered upbringing in San Antonio. Isabella quickly formed a close bond with Talia, with the two becoming best friends. Within days, the then 50-year-old Ray ingratiated himself with the group of 19 and 20-year-olds. He cooked them steak dinners, ordered expensive takeout, and regaled them with stories of his supposed past as a CIA operative and Marine. Ray quickly took on a patriarchal role in the house, screening movies for the students, giving impromptu lectures, and offering his advice and counsel. He presented himself as a self-improvement guru who could help the students achieve their full potential through his quest for potential philosophy. However, Ray's initial charm soon gave way to more sinister behavior. He began conducting therapy sessions with the students, during which he would manipulate them into revealing their deepest insecurities and secrets. He used this information to exert control over them, convincing them that they were damaged and needed his guidance to become better people. By the end of the fall 2010 semester, Ray had focused his attention on Talia's best friend, Isabella. He started sleeping in her room every night, claiming he was supervising her and helping her through psychological issues. When winter break arrived, Ray convinced Isabella's parents that she would end her life if she came home for the holidays. Cut off from her family, Isabella grew increasingly dependent on Ray. During the 2010 to 2011 winter break, Ray took Talia and Isabella to stay at the Upper East Side apartment of his businessman friend, Lee Chen. Throughout their stay, he frequently treated them to extravagant dinners, often paying with cash from his backpack. He controlled every aspect of their activities, including what they ate, where they went, and what they did. Disturbingly, since the apartment had only one bedroom, Ray slept beside both his daughter and Isabella. In January 2011, the three, along with Claudia, Santos, and Daniel, returned to their dorm for the spring semester. By this point, Ray's strong influence on the college students was apparent, which their parents couldn't ignore. Daniel's father, in particular, noticed a significant change in his son's behavior. As Daniel eagerly shared his learnings from Ray, his father couldn't help but feel uneasy, sensing a resemblance to cult-like dynamics. In another instance, Isabella's aunt and mother traveled to New York for dinner with Isabella and Ray. Throughout the evening, Ray dominated the conversation, with Isabella often deferring to him. Meanwhile, Claudia became fixated on Ray's eating and exercise regimen. Her mother noticed Claudia's growing preoccupation with losing weight and dissatisfaction with her appearance. Similar to Daniel's parents, Claudia's parents began to harbor suspicions about Ray when they heard their daughter talk about him. These parents promptly brought Ray to the attention of the school administrators. Although the dean was taken aback upon learning that Ray resided in Slonham Woods 9, he also acknowledged that there wasn't much he could do. Parents were entitled to visit their children in their dormitories, so he felt powerless to intervene. Still, Ray took matters into his own hands and relocated from the dorm to avoid further complications. In July 2011, he returned to Lee Chen's Upper East Side apartment, this time accompanied not only by Talia and Isabella, but also by Daniel, Claudia, and Santos. As with the arrangement from the previous fall, Ray shared the bedroom with Talia and Isabella. Meanwhile, the other three slept on a king-sized mattress they set up in the living room. Now that they were away from school premises, Ray began exerting even more control over the students. They're really now what I call a self-sealed system. You're closed to the outside world. You may be living in the middle of Manhattan, but you're in an altered reality. Every morning, he played a song to wake everyone up, asserting his leadership. He preached about maximizing potential and critiqued individuals. Nightly sessions involved intense self-analysis and group discussions, often leading to sleep deprivation. Around this time, Ray also started to document their daily activities by recording videos, often using his phone to capture the students' actions. These narcissists are so full of themselves and they want to record everything. 
as proof of what they're able to accomplish. In September 2011, Talia returned to Sarah Lawrence. However, the rest of the students stayed behind in the apartment with her father. Another individual would soon join the group, Iban Gukichoa. He was an ex-boyfriend of Talia, who saw her father as a mentor and guiding light, believing in his supposed heroic Marine background. Ray pushed Iban to enlist in the Marines, and upon returning from Afghanistan, he moved to the Upper East Side apartment. Iban was still dealing with PTSD from his time in service, and felt that Ray could help him. He got me through a lot of, uh, I mean, a lot of emotional battles that I had, directing me and guiding me, I should say. He was there for me to help me sort uh, get my bearings again when I came back to civilian society. He quickly became a devoted follower, often acting as Ray's driver and assistant. By autumn 2011, Ray's dominance over the students had escalated noticeably. He began to exert physical force on them and resorted to berating and humiliating tactics. All of these were cloaked under the pretext of fostering their growth and development. Do you understand? She just how it feels. Yeah. What if I pick you up right now? I'm pick you up by your tongue. Or... Also, during this time frame, Santos brought his sisters Yalitza and Felicia into contact with Ray, convinced that he could offer them assistance. Yalitza was a freshman at Columbia University, while Felicia was a medical student at Harvard. Despite their promising academic careers, they fell under Ray's manipulative influence after multiple conversations over the phone. Ray even convinced Felicia to abandon her medical residency and move into the cramped apartment, where she became one of his girlfriends. Yalitza would later follow suit and join their circle. Meanwhile, the apartment owner Li Chen was becoming increasingly concerned with what was going on in his property. He was especially alarmed after finding out that Ray ordered the students to renovate the unit without his permission. Chen ultimately resorted to taking Ray to New York County Civil Court for eviction. However, the legal process dragged on for years before a decision could be reached. While Felicia and Yalitza initially liked their stay in the group, they soon began breaking down under the immense control and pressure that Ray had placed upon them. Oh, no. Can I get up now? Oh, stop talking. At one point, Felicia even tried to take her own life, but was fortunately stopped. Spit him. Ray would somehow convince her to stay after this incident. In the spring of 2013, Daniel distanced himself from the group, withdrawing quietly. Despite enduring harrowing experiences, he refrained from reporting Ray to the authorities out of fear of potential backlash. Around this same period, Ray took several of his victims, Santos, Yalitza, Felicia, Isabella, and Claudia, to his stepfather's home in Pinehurst, North Carolina. There, he forced them to perform grueling manual labor by repairing and renovating the property. He strictly controlled their food intake, putting a lock on the fridge and allowing them to eat only when permitted. The students worked long hours in the pouring rain, using machinery they were unfamiliar with. Ray then manipulated the students into believing they damaged his property and equipment, forcing them to pay exorbitant repair costs. He interrogated them for hours, until they confessed to fabricated misdeeds while recording these coerced admissions. He was brainwashing them by forcing them to over and over again, under, under pressure, admit to doing things that they hadn't done until they either believed it or said that they believed it. Santos and his sisters, under Ray's duress, told their parents they owed around $20,000 for repair and successfully obtained the money from them. Their parents, who were not particularly wealthy, ended up giving Ray six-figure sums from their life savings after he convinced their children of these imaginary debts. Claudia was also manipulated by Ray into believing she owed him a staggering debt, forcing her into working as a lady of the night as a means to repay it. Why have you been hurting me for so long behind my back? Doing damaging things, destroying property. I don't want to. Don't want to what? I don't want to damage things. Beginning in 2014, Claudia was trapped in a nightmarish cycle, working seven days a week and seeing up to five clients per day in various Manhattan hotels. Ray exercised complete control over her, dictating her actions and pocketing the substantial sums she earned. Meanwhile, Isabella served as a bookkeeper, responsible for monitoring the funds generated by Claudia. Additionally, she assisted Ray in the process of laundering the money. 
In 2016, Santos and Yalitza severed ties with Ray. That same year, Li Chen succeeded in evicting Ray from his apartment after years of legal proceedings. Following a period of relocation between several apartments, Ray and the group ultimately found a residence in New Jersey, provided by his friend Scott Muller. By October 2018, Claudia reached a breaking point. She confided in a client about Ray's manipulative behavior, revealing that he was blackmailing her. When Ray discovered this, he stormed into her hotel room, accusing her of trying to harm him and his family. He subjected Claudia to a night of brutal maltreatment, including suffocating her with a plastic bag, beating her, and berating her while she was bound to a chair. After the ordeal, Claudia cleaned up the room after Ray left. She continued seeing clients the next day out of fear of what Ray might do to her next. She lived in constant fear of Larry punishing her, and it seemed like almost everything she did during that time period was done in order to keep him happy. Not long after, the same client Claudia confided in provided her with a train ticket, finally allowing her to escape the clutches of her oppressor. Throughout the harrowing four years she spent coerced into questionable work, Claudia earned a staggering $2.5 million, every penny of which was ruthlessly pocketed by Ray. Isabella, Felicia, and Ebon remained loyal to Ray, but it wasn't long until the ex-convict turned cult leader's evil ways were finally exposed. In early 2019, Journalist Ezra Marcus began investigating rumors about Lawrence Ray's activities at Sarah Lawrence College. He discovered a disturbing website containing videos of Ray's victims making coerced confessions, which led him to contact former students involved with Ray. Their harrowing testimonies revealed a decade of manipulation and mistreatment. Marcus's resulting expose, The Stolen Kids of Sarah Lawrence, was published in New York Magazine in April 2019, bringing national attention to the case. The article also prompted law enforcement to take action. Shortly after the publication of the article, FBI agents tracked down the victims and began interviewing them. They also gathered crucial evidence from them, including cell phone records and emails that documented Ray's control over them. The investigation culminated in a dramatic early morning raid on Ray's residence in Piscataway, New Jersey, on February 11, 2020. A team of federal agents and NYPD officers stormed the house placing Ray under arrest and seizing a trove of incriminating materials, including dozens of hard drives, cell phones, laptops, and handwritten ledgers detailing his illicit activities. The sheer volume of documents uncovered during the search provided an overwhelming body of evidence against Ray. The same recordings he used to control and humiliate his victims now served as the basis for a comprehensive indictment, charging him with a vast array of crimes, including trafficking, racketeering conspiracy, extortion, and money laundering. Good morning. I'm Jeff Berman, U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. Today, we announce criminal charges against this man, Lawrence Ray, who for nearly a decade and abused young women and men emotionally, physically, and for his own financial gain. Sadly, upon learning of Ray's arrest, Ebon took his own life. He was unable to reconcile the indictment of the man he admired and was still convinced that the world was conspiring against them. Lawrence Ray's trial began in March 2022. During the legal proceedings, his own recorded evidence of maltreatment was played in excruciating detail. The court heard how Ray extorted around $1 million from five victims and forced Claudia into service for years until she earned him over $2.5 million. Other victims recounted being physically tormented with Ray brandishing knives and choking them to extract false confessions. Santos described a decade of absolute misery at Ray's hands that drove him to consider taking his life daily. In a final act of delusion, Ray's defense team tried to convince jurors that he truly believed his victims were criminals, working for his nemesis, Bernie Carrick. However, the evidence was too overwhelming to deny. After a four-week trial, the jury swiftly convicted Ray on all 15 counts after just four hours of deliberation. On January 20th, 2023, Lawrence Ray was sentenced to 60 years in federal prison by Judge Louis Lyman, who described his crimes as perpetrated with evil genius and particular cruelty. Ray showed no remorse and instead complained about his prison conditions. Isabella Pollock was also sentenced to four and a half years in prison for her role in aiding Lawrence Ray's decade-long scheme. In addition to her prison term, 
She will also serve three years of supervised release after completing her sentence. Meanwhile, Talia Ray was named as an unindicted co-conspirator, but was never charged with a crime. Despite being the one who introduced Ray to her roommates, her lifelong conditioning by her father played a role in the court's decision to ultimately spare her from criminal liabilities. In victim impact statements, Ray's victim spoke about the profound and lasting trauma he inflicted through a decade of torment. Thankfully, they have now begun the journey of rebuilding their lives. Daniel Levin has since authored a memoir titled Slawnham Woods 9, chronicling his experiences with Lawrence Ray. Claudia has found solace in reuniting with her family. Felicia completed her residency and now practices medicine, reconnecting with her siblings Santos and Yalitza along the way. For these survivors, the road to healing and recovery is going to be a long and difficult one. Nevertheless, their resilience shines brightly as they navigate the challenges ahead. By courageously sharing their stories with the world, they not only reclaim their voices, but also inspire others with their unwavering strength in the face of unimaginable adversity. But I'm thinking a lot about how we can take this experience and try to do the most good with it and create community for other survivors. I feel like a new person. I have a family. I have a past. I have a future, which I didn't have before. I had been trapped for so long closed off from everyone. It feels like I'm coming out and there's light. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.